Um, well, welcome everyone to this uh, tutorial on how to run uh, a free and open source software-based seller network on top of Linux. So what's this going to be all about? Well, uh, it's about uh, implementing GSM GFIRS network elements as free and open source software, which has been something I've been doing for the past uh, few years. Uh, I sometimes call it applied protocol archaeology um, because, well, we're talking about things that were designed in the late 1980s uh, to, at, to some extent in the 1990s, but it's really, really old stuff. Um, and we're doing all of this on top of Linux, but of course it is not Linux itself and all of it runs in the user space. So the connection to Linux is very faint um, at that point. Um, nevertheless, as I said, I was asked by uh, Pablo to present on something that basically goes beyond um, uh, the, the typical kernel networking stuff. So for those of you who uh, don't uh, know what I did before, I have a background in the Linux kernel uh, some years ago. Um, I used to work on NetFilter IP tables, but then moved into, well, um, uh, more of a niche uh, topics. So if you expected anything related to Linux kernel, then you will be disappointed and you still have a chance to leave now. I, I, won't, I won't be uh, upset, uh, I can promise, uh, no, no issue there. Well, sort of, to put things in perspective, let me start with a few, well, um, high-level introductory slides. So let's say you want to run your own TCP IP internet style network. Well, you use off-the-shelf hardware, you take x86 uh, machines or whatever, CPU architecture you fancy. You take Ethernet cards, which are not really cards anymore these days. It's mostly integrated. Use any random Linux distribution. You configure, configure the stack as you want. You have all kinds of fancy features, um, uh, which uh, I don't need to talk about. You use any random web server, any random web browser. All of it is open source software. And then you do whatever modification, extension, whatever you want to do on any part of the stack. And, uh, well, that's basically the world uh, that you know if you work on Linux in TCP IP networking. Now, if you want to run your own GSM network, well, until 2009 at least, the situation looked like this. You go to one of the large equipment vendors, such as, well, I don't want to recount the names. Um, you spend lots of time convincing them that you are actually a, an eligible customer. Um, and as part of that, you have to spend uh, a really large amount of money, typically a six-digit figure in dollars or euros, um, even to go get the minimum necessary subset of network elements to run your own network, uh, even only with a single base station in a university. I've actually been visiting several universities in Europe, um, uh, and very few of them actually have their own mobile communication network. And, uh, well, they all basically told me this uh, kind of a story. And then in the end, uh, particularly if you're a developer or, you know, a hacker or a student or a researcher, um, you end up with lots of black boxes. Well, they might be black in color or not, but anyway, they're closed and um, you cannot really study what they do internally. You cannot really improve them. You cannot hack on it. It's basically, um, well, pretty boring, I would say. So, yeah, I thought myself, well, uh, what's that? Um, I basically grew up on the internet and uh, with free and open source software, and I know a better world. So, well, um, why is there no open source software in the cellular world? Um, or why was there none until uh, well, a few years ago? Um, well, uh, on the first sight, you think, well, all the specs are public on both technologies. So that's not really the reason. You can find the ITF RFCs on TCP IP and that stuff. You find the W3C specs uh, and so on about all the internet and web. Um, it's all public, uh, but the same is true for all the cellular technologies. Um, so you just go to the 3GPP website um, or to the Etsy website and you can download, uh, I think it's about 600, 700 uh, specification documents, each having, well, hundreds to, I don't know how many pages, but all of the documentation is there. Um, I mean, I think the only things that have not been published originally was the encryption algorithms, but then you could always run a network without encryption. Um, so it's not really a limiting factor. Um, but then for the first almost 20 years of the existence of uh, digital cellular protocol stacks, there has not been any free and open source software in that area. And I think it's basically the classic conflict just goes back to, well, the circuit switch telcos versus the BBS community versus the packet switch guys goes back to, well, the OSI ISO world versus TCP IP. Um, and, uh, well, that's basically sort of what we inherit in, in the cellular world. 
And if you basically, sorry, go back to this ISO, OSI, and ITU on the one hand side, and uh, TCP IP and the IETF on the other hand side, or the more like internet way of, of doing standards, I think the cellular world today is the only um, large technology area where sort of the, the open and internet style things of, of specifying uh, uh, systems has not uh, prevailed. Because, um, well, basically, if you go back, like, Circuit switch, telecom, PSTN, ISDN, and so on, they all had a very strong foothold there, but well, today it's all VoIP, so who cares? So it's basically all TCP, IP, and SIP. Um, but the cellular world is where they have been strong and they are still strong in this uh, traditional model. Well, so some people started to work on free and open source software on GSM, well, to boldly go where no fastest hacker has gone before, where protocol stacks are deep and where acronyms are plentiful. Um, so, we started a couple of projects. Uh, initially, it was called BS11 ABIS, then it was called BSC Hack, then it was called OpenBSC. Um, lots of other related projects uh, were created. I'll talk about those and basically how you can use those to run your own cellular network um, on free and open source software. In the end, we created something called Osmocom, which is an umbrella project for all kinds of people working on all kinds of mobile communications in free software. So Osmocom is for open source mobile communications. Um, and it's not only about GSM, GPRS, but people are working on various satellite telephony systems, um, working on uh, professional mobile radio systems and all kinds of things that are mobile communications. So, well, before we go into actually running our own network or configuring our own network, um, let's have a look and take a step back what actually is a GSM network and how it looks like. So this is a, well, basically the, the, the drawing you will find on the GSM page at Wikipedia, which uh, by, inc by coincidence somebody from the Osmocom project has actually drawn. Um, but, uh, so basically you have a couple of network elements and what most people are familiar with is basically their mobile phone. It may not look like this anymore, um, form factor has slightly changed, um, but nevertheless it still has today a SIM card that might also change in the future, unfortunately, but well, that's basically uh, the, the mobile equipment and then you have a radio interface um, and that's sort of where it ends for most people. There's a radio interface and then yes, you still know there are these antennas on top of the roof, but then basically behind there is where the black boxes start. Um, this antenna on the roof is basically what's called a cell site, uh, which is a, a, an installation there. And attached to the antenna is what's called a BTS, the base transceiver station. And that's basically, well, as the name sort of implies, it's a transceiver. Um, and it's not really much more. It's not an intelligent component. It doesn't do much uh, itself. It just converts basically from the radio frequency to a wired interface and vice versa. Um, and the protocol, or well, not the protocol, sorry, the interface um, that this BTS speaks is called ABIS. Um, the interfaces all have interesting names, um, and the protocols have even more interesting names, so there's going to be a lot of acronyms, as I said already on uh, the previous slides. So you have all these names indicated in blue here on the slides between the individual components. I will not walk through all of them, uh, that uh, would be too much. But what's interesting from a like protocol stack or network protocol geek is that each of those interfaces has a completely different protocol stack. So it's not like in the internet where basically everything is flat and you have routers that just pass packets left or right or maybe not pass them in case they're filtering them. But um, it's basically you have dedicated interfaces, point-to-point -point interfaces, and each of those interfaces features most often a completely different protocol stack than any of the other interfaces. Um, and that's pretty odd. Um, and it ends up basically, well, you have to learn about lots of different protocol stacks and lots, about lots of different protocols. So a couple of acronyms to get started with. We have MS, which is not Microsoft, which is the mobile station. Um, we have BTS, the base transceiver station. I said that already. Some two other words that we will encounter in this context is called TRX and TS. TRX is the transceiver, which is basically a sub part of a, a BTS. It serves eight TS, which are time slots, um, because it's a time division multiple access system and we have a base station controller. So that's basically the, the, the acronyms in, in the radio uh, access network. On the core network, we have other components like an MSC, which is uh, not the Mediterranean shipping company, but it is the mobile switching center. Um, and well, some people have different associations with those acronyms, so I have to clarify them. There is the HLR. Um, the home location register, there is SMS service center and other elements uh, uh, as uh, you go on and, and look at different services in different scenarios. 
Um, in terms of the protocols, and I'll look at those protocols a little bit more in detail, you have something called the LAPD, which is not the Los Angeles Police Department, it's the Link Access Protocol D channel for mobile, um, uh, which is based on LAPD, for those of you who have any uh, well, background about ISDN. Um, basically, GSM is ISDN with a wireless interface, more or less, and added mobility. So you have a LAPD version that's uh, basically adapted for a lossy radio interface, and that's LabDM. On top of that, you have a couple of other protocols or sub-layers of basically layer three protocols. So all of the four mentioned on this slide below LabDM are actually all layer three protocols. They coexist next to each other. We have radio resources, mobility management, call control, and connection management. There's a couple more, but let's stay uh, on, on, on this subset for a moment. Um, radio Resource is uh, responsible for establishing and releasing dedicated channels because what we are talking about here, at least in the first half of this presentation, is circuit switch telephony services. That's what GSM was about and is about. So basically in a circuit switch system you have a dedicated channel that's established at some point, it's released at some point, and that needs to happen in some way. But the radio resource uh, actually uh, layer is even more, it's about step not just a voice call, the user, how can I say, the user perception of a circuit switch bearer, but it's also it's about really establishing signaling channels and so on. Because the mobile phone, um, when it's idle and basically not do, having any interaction with the network, it's really idle and there is no dedicated connection or time slot or any kind of allocation of, of air resources to it. It's basically only when necessary and when required, such a dedicated channel is established between the phone and the network, but in the idle time, no such channel exists. And radio resource is about basically establishing those radio channels. Mobility management, well, as the name implies, it relates to mobility. In a cellular network, you have multiple cells. Uh, terminals are moving around. So something has to keep track of where those devices are and how to reach them and so on. That's mobility management. But as part of the MM protocol sublayer, you also have things like registration to the network, um, which is called uh, the location update procedure. We look into this uh, shortly. Um, there is uh, also authentication um, uh, based on a shared secret um, that uh, is, can be performed, it doesn't have to be. Um, and uh, some other related functionalities uh, under MM which are not really mobility related as such. CC is call control. Um, call control, well, it's for voice, circuit switch data and fax. So basically using CC call control, you establish uh, voice uh, bearers and, and well, other bearers, uh, but voice mostly these days. Well, this is a talk about GSM. <laughs> Happy somebody's taking that seriously. No, it's, don't worry, I don't mind. Um, I could probably make your phone ring if I tried, but okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so call control is derived from Q931, which is again the uh, signaling protocol for voice uh, telephony in ISDN. Um, so think more about H323, less about SIP, but sort of more into the ITU uh, call control area. And then we have connection management, which well, I'll skip for the sake of simplicity now. So um, we had this diagram about the GSM network itself. I'm, now I'm going to show a diagram a little bit about what kind of different components exist in the Osmocom universe to run such networks. Um, and then in the next few slides, I'll compare that as in to basically what's the standard GSM network, what's the subset that we implement, and how do these things relate to each other. Um, basically, the blue blocks you can see is interaction with uh, third-party components uh, that are possible because all of the interfaces, if we go back to the, sorry, if we go back to that slide, all of these interfaces, like the UM interface, ABIS interface, A interface, B interface, C interface, and so on, they are all standardized and, well, at least ideally should be vendor interoperable, but um, they may uh, sometimes have vendor-specific dialects to some extent, but at least they should be interoperable. And so basically we implement some of those interfaces and we can interoperate on those interfaces with other components. So um, what we are going to look at specifically now in the beginning of this uh, tutorial is the Osmo BTS, which is a uh, base transceiver implementation as open source and what we call the NITB, the network in the box. NITB is an acronym you will not find in any GSM spec. It's something that we invented to basically um, simplify the system and, and um, well, basically reduce it into, into one component. So if we look at sort of 
the the fancy slide I started out with with the diagram of a GSM network and just put this into a, a directed graph. It looks a little bit like this. We have lots of different phones. They're called MS. They interface over a radio interface with different base transceiver stations around the, the city or whatever country. Um, they also interface to different BSCs. I mean, there can be multiple, just for simplification, there's only one. Then we have an MSC, um, uh, the Mobile Switching Center, which basically handles the mobility management, call control, and all these things. Uh, some other elements that are connected, again, interconnected with this MSC. Now, um, if we look at it on the Osmocom point of view, what we have implemented as free software, we basically decided um, initially we create something called the NITB, the network in the box, where all of the core network side components are in one program for simplicity. Um, you can take lots of shortcuts if you don't have to implement all these uh, specified interfaces there. Um, and also the configuration for the user is much more simplified if he doesn't have to configure like five, six components, but only one. So basically, the minimum subset of free software in the Osmocom world that you need to run your own cellular network based on GSM is, well, you need a phone, surprise. Um, you need a base transceiver station, which we have a software implementation called Osmo BTS uh, that I'll uh, explain uh, further, and the Osmo NITB, the network in the box uh, that implements all of the rest of the, uh, the network components. Um, and uh, now, of course, well, what kind of BTS am I going to use? Because I mean, I cannot just buy software, I cannot create a radio interface. I need some specific hardware uh, to that. And um, initially when we started to uh, work on this project, we basically found some uh, old refurbished uh, Siemens base stations on eBay, um, 28 kilograms each. This is a micro BTS, this is a very small one. So you don't have a full 19 inch rack or multiple of them, but just a 28 kilogram unit, you can even lift it. Um, and um, it makes, up, makes a, a nice heating under your desk, um, 200 watts or so. Um, anyway, so that's what we started with. Um, we added also support to the Osmo NITB for multiple different base stations from other vendors, uh, basically reverse engineering their specific ABIS dialect, ones, uh, one for each of those uh, vendors and systems. And then finally, I think in around 2011 or so, we started on writing Osmo BTS basically to have also an open source implementation of that base transceiver station. Um, and you can run that either with, uh, let's say, a set of proprietary hardware and physical layer implementation, um, which is, uh, well, ends up in, in, in a device like this, uh, what we call the Sysmo BTS, um, or you can use a general purpose SDR. Some of you might be familiar with the USRP devices uh, sold by Atos, for example, um, and then use another also open source program, the Osmo TRX and Osmo BTS, and then you can also create a, a base station out of those components. Um, I'm going to assume the Sysmo BTS case in the following uh, tutorial, but uh, it's not really that much different for any type of other model. So we start with the Osmo BTS software, which has a couple of uh, different modules. There is, um, well, uh, there is the core, basically, of the program itself, and then it has backends for different hardware implementations of base transceiver stations. So this Osmo BTS Sysmo for the Sysmo BTS, there's Osmo BTS TRX for this general purpose SDR-based um, hardware. There's two other vendors uh, that have recently been added, so we're now interestingly at a point where even vendors of such physical layer and hardware come to us and ask us to basically add uh, support to Osmo BTS uh, for their specific hardware. Um, and uh, that has happened with two uh, vendors who are listed uh, below there. And then basically the common part is shared and it's like, you know, like different network Ethernet card drivers in, in the kernel or something like that. Do you have any idea what their motivation is? Their motivation? Well, um, it's very easy. Uh, their motivation is they are companies um, uh, deeply involved into the signal processing aspect in producing RF hardware, and they don't have their own implementation of a BTS, so the, the layer two and, and, and all the stuff that we implemented. So it's pretty easy. Either they license a propriety one for I don't know how much money, or they write it themselves, or oh, there is this open source program. So um, that I think is sort of the, the explanation for that. So of course, you wouldn't expect that from Ericsson or Nokia or something like that. They have their own implementations and they're not building new GSM equipment anyway. I mean, that's like, as I said, 1980s technology. Um, nevertheless, I mean, we can talk about the use cases and why and so on, uh, maybe um, at some later point. So um, 
yeah, basically you have different hardware, diff maybe different physical layers, and they somehow tie into Osmo BTS. Osmo BTS itself is a user space program um, that you can uh, compile and run on Linux. Um, uh, it um, basically, we, given that several of the people involved in, in Osmocom projects have some Linux kernel background, it uh, follows Linux kernel coding style. We have MSGBs, which are basically a user space version of the socket buffer. You have MSGB push and pull and, and all these things. Um, we have uh, basically uh, taken the, Linux, uh, the, the linked list implementation and the RV tree and whatnot that we know from the Linux kernel. We run all of that in user space. Um, and um, uh, the, the software architecture is basically um, always a single-threaded event loop uh, design uh, based on select. Um, uh, we don't really like threads um, so much um, and rather work uh, in, in such an environment. Um, yeah, uh, so basically user space programs that inherit some of the useful things that we knew from the Linux kernel network stack. Um, you find these two colorful blocks in the corners there. Um, I'll talk about them in more detail later and also show you a demo. Basically, um, with these kind of processes that implement some kind of network processing uh, functionality, you need to somehow interact with them. You need to inspect state, you need to configure them, and so on. Um, and one thing, again, based on my Linux uh, networking background, basically, uh, while I, I'm familiar with Quagga and Zebra, and I think also there are some related talks uh, at this event here. So basically what we did, I mean, and, and Zebra and Quagga have what they also call a VTY interface, a virtual teletype interface, a command line interface that's sort of similar to what people know from certain proprietary uh, network switches and routers. Um, and um, we basically took the VTY code out of Zebra, um, put it in a separate shared library that we can uh, basically link all of our programs against. And um, they also have a similar um, command line based interface for uh, introspection, configuration, and so on. Um, and then we also have a control interface. That's sort of a human interface. I mean, you don't really want to script uh, the command line interface of, of something like that. That's the VTVice for human users. And we have a control interface, which is a programmatic interface. Very simple, like a get and set and trap operations, high level modeled after SNMP, but then the encoding, of course, not uh, in such a nightmare and not importing net SNMP or some other really large monster of uh, code. So um, that's basically what we have in terms of interfaces. Yeah, uh, sorry, this sort of my, my speaking uh, didn't match the slide anymore. Now we have that slide. Um, this libosmo VTY is basically the library in which we have this uh, VTY code. We also have a lot of other libraries, uh, libosmo core, libosmo GSM, and so on, that implement several other parts of the uh, related uh, stacks. So libosmo core is the library that contains the linked list handling, the uh, the message buffers, and, and, and all that stuff um, uh, that uh, we took, or at least uh, were inspired from the Linux kernel. Okay, so basically, yeah, then you end up at this VTY code, I didn't mention that, also handles configuration files. So basically, you have both of the options, either of editing your config file and putting it there and just having it parsed by the software, or you can interactively by using configure terminal and then, you know, changing the configuration settings on the fly of the system interactively um, and then uh, save it, like copy uh, running config, startup config, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so in this example, and I'm going to show you uh, a practical demo shortly, um, the Osmo BTS software runs in an embedded ARM Linux system that's inside this black box that just happens to have the color of black, but still not being a black box. Um, and uh, we can access that system over either serial console or, of course, SSH. Uh, it just has a normal Ethernet uh, and, and uh, ARM Linux in there. Um, and uh, then in terms of hardware, th there is basically a shared memory interface to a DSP, which then drives the radio and, and the physical layer. We have the configuration file, um, and uh, basically that's what we need to configure first uh, when we want to start uh, running the software and, and building up uh, our small um, autonomous uh, free software-based GSM network. Um, the number of settings we need to configure is extremely limited, as you can see. This is actually really everything that we need to configure on the BTS itself. Well, the frequency band in which we operate, GSM has 
four frequency bands that it operates in. Um, this is one of them, 1800 megahertz band um, used in Europe. Um, it's a 900 megahertz band also used in Europe uh, and well, pretty much all of the rest of the world. And then there are two bands that are pretty much only used in uh, North America. And um, then we have a second setting that we need to set, which is called the unit ID. That's sort of just like an identifier by which the BTS uh, identifies itself towards the BSC or network in the box uh, further up the stack. So basically, uh, the BSC knows who is connecting. Uh, it could be a username or it could be some other identifier. It's just a, a random number that you, you put there, and it has to be unique in your network. And finally, the last setting is you need to configure what's the OML remote IP. And that's basically um, OML stands for Organization and Maintenance Link. Um, and that's one element of the ABIS protocol between the BTS and the BSC or network in the box. And um, so basically, we're telling the BTS this is the IP address to connect to. So it's like the BTS is the client, the, the uh, network in the box is a server. We tell it, uh, please connect there. All of the other configuration, and I can assure you there are plenty of configuration parameters and values uh, that go into such a BTS, they are basically downloaded by the BSC over this OML interface after connection. So um, basically the idea is that there's not much configuration or provisioning on, on BTSs, you just put them in the field and then they connect to the, uh, to the BSC and then all the parameters like on which frequency to transmit and with which power and, and what all kinds of protocol level parameters are sent over this OML protocol. Um, which we have implemented both sides, uh, first in the BSC side and then the BTS side, because we started with proprietary BTSs in uh, the beginning. So um, we have this uh, BTS uh, configuration. As I said, this is the, the, the only three settings that we really need to do. Um, uh, there's, of course, more parameters, but uh, these are the three uh, that uh, we must set. And then on the other hand side, we have the network in the box, uh, which we can run on any other Linux device. Uh, I can run it here on my laptop. In fact, it's such a small, we were talking about, I think like 300 kilobytes of executable. This is really, really small um, code because we don't use C++, we don't use Boost or any of these uh, well, frightening monsters. Um, and um, uh, you, we can actually run it also on the embedded ARM core. So there's basically in, in this uh, BTS, there is a, 200 something megahertz ARM core, ARM 926, so also like Stone Age technology. And um, in this, which is much less CPU power than any of the CPU cores in your phone in your pocket has, we can run an entire network now, um, including the BTS and all the other elements. So basically you only need to apply power and run this software and then you have your, um, your uh, um, you sell a network. And the reason why is this also simple and so resource, um, uh, why can it work in such uh, low resources? Again, the age of the protocols related and the age of the system. If you look at uh, real, like um, these, these uh, 28 kilogram BTSs that uh, we started with, they have like seven or eight processors in there. Um, and each has their own memory and they boot over serial lines across them and so on because, well, it was the 1980s technologies. And if you want to implement such a system with like, you know, 8051 cores or whatever they had at the time and the few kilobytes of RAM they had, well, then you had to build it that way. But today, implementing these old specs uh, on modern hardware is basically a no-brainer. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to run it on my laptop. Um, and then we can look at the various uh, configuration settings that we need to set. Well, maybe I'll walk through the slide first and then show it. Um, the most important parameters we need to configure in any such network is, well, some identity parameters. Uh, there is the network country code and the mobile network code. Um, they basically are numeric identifiers for which operator the cell belongs to. Um, uh, the country code is an ITU list, uh, I forgot the name of the ITU spec, uh, to be honest, but there's a list uh, basically for every country. In Germany it's 262, I don't know what, uh, uh, off my head what's used in Spain here. Um, in the US it's, uh, yeah, uh, actually the US has so many operators that they needed to use multiple country codes. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's uh, 301 is one of them, for example. Um, mobile network codes are then codes for the operators inside the specific country. So, and of course, they are always the namespace is restricted to the country. So, 02 may mean Vodafone in Germany, but it may mean something completely else here. 
basically mostly historical. So in Germany, for example, one is uh, T-Mobile because they were the government-owned a company that ran the first GSM network, then Vodafone came, so they got two, and then basically is the way how they allocate these codes. Um, the operator name that we can specify, well, it's actually typo, it's a short name, of course, not a short name. You will find that when you try it. Um, and uh, uh, the names uh, are only transmitted after the phone registers. So basically, when a phone does a network scan, it can only see these numeric codes, and then it uses information uh, stored at the compile time of the firmware to map those codes to operator names. Um, it can also, ha there can be an updated table on the SIM card that does this mapping, but this is why sometimes people uh, see confusing operator names on their phones, like maybe uh, the name of the operator has changed or they have merged with another company and you still see the old operator name is because it, basically of this that uh, at least initially, only the numeric identifiers are transmitted. Only after you successfully register to a network, you can give it a string name, and actually a short and a long one, and even in UTF-16 these days. Um, sorry? UTF-16? Who came up with that? <laughs> well, um, yeah. Uh, so, um, the uh, some other parameters that you must set, I mean, lots of others are optional and don't really matter, is uh, the authentication policy. That's uh, basically something related to our uh, network in the box. Whom do we want to permit in our network? Um, closed is the only recommended setting, which basically means you need to explicitly authorize a subscriber to join this network. Um, if you run it in open mode, which you can, then basically all the phones that try to register will register, but then they lose service on the public network, and that's not what you want to do, because it may be considered as interfering with a public telecommunication network, which in Germany, according to the law, has up to five years in prison, um, which I don't think anyone has ever enforced, but um, just uh, as a kind reminder. Um, some other settings that we need to configure, well, um, uh, basically, as I said, we need to basically configure all the parameters of these base transceiver stations on the network in the box. Uh, what type of BTS is it again? Which band does it operate in? What's the maximum transmit power for mobile stations in this uh, cell? Uh, how often should these phones rep uh, periodically report their location? Um, we need to set the unit ID again, so to match the configuration snippet on the BSC side or on the NITB side and the BTS side, what voice codecs uh, are supported and so on. There's lots and lots and lots of configuration parameters, but these are sort of the, the key ones that uh, one should uh, configure. Um, now it becomes slightly more technical. We also need to configure the transceivers inside the base station. We need to specify on which frequency chan uh, um, channel number they run on basically the ARFCN here, 871. Um, this translates as an, a formula that you can put it in and it tells you what's the act actual frequency. It's 1.8 uh, something gigahertz. Um, you configure basically the transmit power of your BTS side as well, but the way how it's, it's basically inverse, you don't specify the transmit power, but you specify the amount of attenuation or reduction that you want to have from the nominal power. That's how they put it in the spec. Um, and then finally, you need to decide on what kind of channel configuration you're going to run your, your seven time slots. And um, well, there's one time slot that you always need to run uh, in a specific way uh, for to include uh, the common signaling channels uh, that identify the cell as a cell and that make it actually that for which phones look like. That's the CCCH that you need to um, have uh, at least in one of the time slots. Then TCHF is a traffic channel full rate. That's basically for voice calls. And finally, I put one time slot in here in PDCH, that's a packet data channel for GPRS for data, uh, like IP deck, uh, data communication over um, the network, which we will get to next. I'm just starting with the GSM part and then we'll get to the packet uh, side uh, in a few minutes. So basically that's what we need to configure. Um, and that's really it. So at this point, after we've done the configurations I described, and we'll just do that uh, quickly uh, right now, uh, we have a network that's running, and um, then you can try uh, to do a search, a network search, you will see the network running here. And just to illustrate sort of what do we expect or what do we expect phones to do uh, when they see this network, well, this is sort of what a phone does when you power it up. 
The SIM card is uh, checked for the last cell before it was switched off, assuming that you power it on. It's basically a cache, so after you switch it on again, it assumes, well, maybe I didn't move my location, so the same cell should be there. If it's still there, register to that. If not, then we perform a network scan. It basically does a power scan, like where are strong carriers in the spectrum. Then it tries to synchronize to those carriers, try to read the beacon messages, so-called system information messages that contain the identity, like the MNC and MCC, these uh, number codes, um, and then creates a list of all the available cells and networks. And then it tries to see if one of the networks is the home operator. If yes, then always use that one. And if not, then try any random other operator that's strong. Um, and once it has identified the cell that it wants to try to uh, camp on, this is actually how it's called in the spec. So phones are camping on cells. Uh, it's quite interesting uh, vocabulary. Um, you perform uh, what's called a location update uh, operation. Location update, basically, well, the name implies what it is, but in this case, it's a specific type of location update, which is called IMSI Attach. IMSI is the International Mobile Sur Subscriber Identity, which is a number that's stored on your SIM card, which is basically your unique subscriber identity. And uh, it basically says, well, this phone has just been switched on. I want to attach to this network. I don't only want to update my location, but I, this is my first time attaching the network now. Um, and then sort of other procedures follow, and I can show you long letter diagrams if you're interested. But in the end, um, either the location update will be accepted or it will be rejected. And when it's accepted, um, uh, then the phone basically uh, stays on that cell and um, uh, you can use the services of the network. So basically, after we've configured our network, we can check if we see those location update messages when phones try to register, and then we know basically the network has been set up um, accordingly. So I'll just very quickly do that um, and uh, switch to some other terminals so we can... Um, no. Nah. So I'm basically uh, attaching the um, go uh, going over serial line to this uh, embedded ARM uh, processor that I have sitting here in the Sysmo BTS. Um, logged in uh, to the system, and um, uh, there there is uh, ETC Osmocom Osmo BTS config, which well has lots of things inside, uh, mostly configuring what uh, verbosity of logging at which level of which subsystem we want, but that's all optional. And then we finally see the settings that we just saw on the slides: uh, the uh, the band, uh, the unit ID, the um, uh, remote IP address, and then again all kinds of other settings which we could just leave out, and, and the system would use defaults. So um, basically, uh, we tell the system to connect to this IP address, which happens to be the IP address of my laptop, where we run the NITV software. So that's uh, I already pre-configured it here. Just wanted to quickly show it to you. Um, then here on my laptop now. Um, we have um, the OpenBSC config file, which looks similar since it's generated by the same configuration library. We again have uh, the logging configuration. We have more subsystems that we can configure. So basically, each of those is one. You can identify some of them, call control, mobility management, and so on. And you can specify the logging verbosity for all of the different parts of the system. Um, in the end, we have the network, which here we run on country code 1 and network code 1 which uh, is a number is reserved for testing purpose. We call it the Osmocom network. We call, could call it the NetDev network. Um, nobody cares. Um, lots of other parameters that we, uh, again, leave at their defaults. Um, then we specify the BTS uh, that we have, the band, uh, some other parameters that we can ignore. Um, in the end, important is the unit ID, as was listed on the slides. This must match on both sides. Then we have the transceiver configuration where we say, well, this is the channel number that we want to operate in. This is the power. It will not be reduced. And here the individual um, time slots, uh, then uh, traffic channels for voice. This is signaling channels. And that's uh, for packet data at the end, uh, one time slot. And again, more parameters that we can ignore um, for this uh, case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start um, the network in the box process here. and. I hear an interesting sound that I shouldn't be hearing, but well, let's ignore that for a second. Um, it's, uh, 
Yeah, so basically we see, well, uh, it just tells us that something has been connected. Uh, basically, some connections have been made uh, to certain TCP ports. We see uh, here uh, that it's bootstrapping RSL, which is one of the APIS sub-interfaces. Uh, actually, let's go back uh, and stop it. I'm just pressing Control-C to stop the process. And let's um, start Wireshark so you get an idea of what's happening here. Um, we want TCP, uh, yeah, there we go. Exactly. So basically, the, the way how this Avis protocol is encapsulated over IP in the end is encapsulated in, in TCP and on those two port numbers, 3002, 3003. Um, so if we start a capture, and uh, we contributed also the Wireshark dissectors for the GSM protocols, which haven't been there before. So um, uh, now I'm starting the network in the box again. Um, yeah, and uh, things are starting. So you can see lots of messages uh, get passing across, that's um, basically um, uh, the, the configuration of this. So you see, well, there is a site, PTS site manager that's uh, getting configured, and you have radio channels that send event reports, and it basically is an object model, how you remotely uh, configure objects in the BTS. That's basically the entire bring-up procedure. And at the end, um, we basically have uh, the BTS uh, started up and uh, operational. Um, so now if you were to do a network scan, and actually some people are apparently already trying to do this, um, you would see that there is a network with MCC1 and MNC1. So if anyone uh, fancies to do a manual operator search on their phone, you will see that there is one that you don't usually encounter in Spain. Um, it might be called SIM test or something like that because the name again comes from your phone and not uh, from the network at this point. Um, and what we see here already is these uh, location update request messages. So some phones are trying to register. We reject them because we don't know them. So we basically tell them to go away. If we look at this in the protocol trace, um, sorry for that. Um, yeah, what's, what's up with this Wireshark? Um, so we see also those, um, those messages and we can of course um, decode them. Um, why can I not expand subtrees? Yeah, there we go. So we see the, the layer three protocol messages of, uh, of, of the GSM in, in Wireshark at that point, and we see exactly what's happening. And that's also why it's very useful for teaching or for research, because you can really see what's happening on the network side, especially also when you start in the packet data network, so you know exactly what your phone does and what it accesses and what kind of messages it sends and so on, what the operator does to your phone. Um, okay. That basically as a as a quick uh, and, and you can you can try to find the network you can try to register to it. Meanwhile, I'll um, also access our VTY interface. So basically, we can do telnet localhost 4242 is oops sorry is the port that we uh, run our VTY on, and then uh, you have a, a typical command line interface. So you can basically say show BTS and it will tell you well details about this BTS. You can say show TRX and it will tell you details about the transceivers. You can do the same with the time slots. Um, you can uh, do all kinds of things. You can do, uh, you can access the configuration uh, by configure terminal. Um, you can then basically yeah, do the same thing that we did in the config file and so on. You can explore the system. You can also from the command line send SMSs to subscribers and authorize them and then do all kinds of things. You can also configure the logging and logging verbosity. But anyway, yeah, so basically we see a couple of phones trying to register here and uh, they will all be rejected at this point. Okay, getting back to the slides, so we can actually um, uh, get uh, forward with the presentation. So now we have a GSM network running. Well, how can we verify that? Well, that's what I said. Uh, you can start to explore the GSM network services that are there, like <coughs> making calls from phones to phones, um, assigning phone numbers, uh, sending SMSs, whatnot typical things that you expect. Uh, you can use the VTY, uh, different port numbers for different components that we have. Um, that's an example, like uh, you can show details about a subscriber with a certain IMSI and you see is he authorized or not. Extension is what we, oops, sorry. Extension is what we call the phone number because, well, uh, we thought in terms of a PBX and therefore it's an extension number. Uh, the IMSI, other identities, when have we seen that subscriber last, uh, that kind of stuff. But now then, well, um, let's extend that with GPRS services. So just 
as meanwhile, do you see the one one network when you do the network search? Yeah, okay. So yeah, I cannot really allow you to enter. I mean, I, I could if I knew you were IMSI, but I mean, we can we can do that at the end. I'd rather go on with the uh, the GPRS part um, because that's what a lot of people are interested in today. I mean, circuit switch telephony is like woo, you know. Um, people still use that, um, but anyway. Um, so uh, GSM uh, is a pure circuit switch technology, and then. In the late 90s, GPRS was specified. And GPRS is a packet uh, add-on to GSM, and um, it adds new network elements to the network, um, and then you can tunnel IP through it. So if we start from the, um, uh, the uh, original um, digraph uh, of uh, the GSM network, the simplified one I drew, we have additional new components, the PCU, the SGSN, and the GGSN. The PCU is the packet control unit. It runs the RLC and MAC protocols. Uh, we have the SGSN, the serving GPRS support node, which sort of does the same thing as an MSC and VLR does in the circuit switch side. Um, and then we have the GGSN, which is the gateway GPRS support node, which terminates the tunnels. So basically on the right-hand side out of your GGSN is, are the IP packets that your phone enters on the left-hand side. So basically the entire network presents a, IP, a tunnel for IP data that goes through. And it's not just IP, it's a generic um, tunnel because at the time GPRS was developed, as I said, in the late 90s, it was not clear, at least to the people in the telecom industry, it was apparently not clear yet that the internet would be the next thing. Um, so uh, they thought, well, we also need to support X25 and other packet uh, technologies because who knows where this IP goes and whether it's any anything we need to take seriously. Anyway, so. In, we have also signaling messages. There's basically GMM, which is the same as MM uh, in the circuit switch side. Uh, we have session management, SM. Uh, it's not anything else. It's only session management, of course. Uh, nobody would ever think of anything else. And um, it is about the establishment and management and teardown of packet data tunnels. So you can basically establish a tunnel by means of GPRS session management which then activates something that's called a PDP context, a packet data, what's the P at the end? No, I forgot. Anyway, you see too many acronyms. Um, uh, it's a context, basically, and the context corresponds to a tunnel. And you can have multiple of those tunnels, which is a lot of what a lot of people don't know, is that you can have multiple different IP tunnels in parallel um, over a packet data network. And one can, for example, lead to the public IP internet. Another one could lead to a private IP network of any sort and they can exist in parallel. So, uh, because we all like protocol stacks, um, I have illustrated the protocol stack for GPRS, um, and I can assure you, if you go to UMTS, HSPA, and LTE, they will all look uh, similarly fancy. Um, so, uh, in the end, we have the user who wants to communicate with HTTP, TCP, and IP. At least that's what I presume that people would want to do in this example. Um, and then we have here the mobile station, the BTS, the BSC, uh, and packet control unit, the SGSN, the GGSN. Um, and basically, right of the GGSN is the internet. And then we have, you see, all kinds of additional protocol layers underneath. Um, there is my personal favorite, and we will get to that in the next slide, SNDCP and LLC and all kinds of other protocols. And then some protocols terminate at the BSC or PCU. Um, then some protocols terminate at the SGSN, and then some protocols are finally tunneled through. So, and as, I mean, this is the original spec where everything runs on E1 lines, of course, and not on IP at the, at the transport level. But today, of course, all of these networks use IP underneath, or at least most of them. Um, so it means where it states E1 here today, you may have another couple of protocol uh, uh, elements like uh, UDP or frame relay in UDP and IP, or you may have SCTP in IP. So basically you have another IP layer down there, and then you have the actual user IP layer, which is like five, six layers up the stack. Okay, now um, this is just to explain the protocol names, and SNDCP is my favorite just because of the name. It's the Subnetwork Dependent Convergence Protocol, which I always have to think of Star Trek's like Scotty to the Bridge. You have to remodulate the Subnetwork Dependent Convergence Protocols. It's, um, it's right out of Star Trek, this name. I don't know how somebody can come up with such a name, and I don't know what would converge with this protocol in the first place, but then, well, 
maybe it was just uh, a joke by the people who invented it. So anyway, if you want to extend our uh, GSM network with GPRS functionality, I mean, we already have the MS, the BTS, and the NITB. Then we need to add those GPRS components, and uh, we have an Osmo PCU, an Osmo SGSN, and no, we have an open GGSN, not Osmo GGSN, because we didn't write it. Luckily, somebody else did that job. So um, uh, we have to configure and run these additional elements. Um, the PCU itself we run on the BTS, because the PCU needs access to the actual radio interface, the physical layer. Um, and then we run the SGSN and GGSN on uh, my laptop in this example. Uh, we have new interfaces, the GB and the GTP interface. Um, uh, in this, well, actually, this is not the G, well, forget about it. Yeah, we have new interfaces with new protocol stacks, and we need to <coughs> configure the elements. Um, if we want to look at it in, from this point of view, um, we have the network in the box that handles the circuit switch side. We have the BTS. The BTS exposes a Unix domain socket uh, for the PCU to attach to. Um, then the PCU exposes this GB over IP interface, uh, which is basically uh, UDP with NS and BSS GP um, in, in the layer stacking to the SGSN. And then we have another protocol called GTP, which uh, we'll talk about tomorrow as well, uh, because for GTP, actually, there is now a Linux kernel implementation that uh, hopefully will get mainline at some point. So finally, we have a connection to the kernel again. Um, OK, good. So that's what we need to configure. Um, we um, have, again, lots of more settings. Uh, none of them make a lot of use if you don't really want to study these protocols in detail. Um, basically, you have, again, two different additional protocols um, here, the um, NS and the BSSGP protocol. And then those two we need to configure on both the PCU and the SGSN side. And they both have fancy identifiers, um, uh, the NSEI, the NSVCI, um, and so on. We need to configure those identifiers. Again, all you have to know is they have to be unique. Um, then we need, to conf oops, we need to configure the UDP port number and, and IP address over which these elements should configure. Um, the same on the SGSN side. Uh, we need to configure uh, the um, uh, IP address and port number to which to bind. And then we have the GTP interface towards the GGSN um, here. And um, well, this is a UDP-based protocol, and uh, it uses always the same port number. So you um, can, if you want to run the SGSN and the GGSN on the same host, the only way you can do this is basically by running them on different IP addresses. Um, and that's why here in the config you will see that the local IP address is 127.0.0.2 and the remote address is 127.0.0.1. So we can have two processes on the same UDP port number talking to each other. Um, then finally, we have something called APN mapping, which I ah, shouldn't do that. Um, which basically, well, uh, if you've ever configured a mobile phone into more detail, you will have heard about an APN name. So basically, when you want to set up a mobile uh, IP connection, you have to set an APN name. Um, well, it could be whatever, internet.vodafone.de or something like that. It looks like a DNS domain name. It smells like a DNS domain. It also maps to a DNS domain name, but outside of the public root zone. It's something fancy the GSMA came up with. So basically, you have a string identifier that says what kind of um, access point uh, to which IP network do I want to connect. Most people, of course, connect to the public internet through the access point name of their operator. But then if you think of machine-to-machine -machine devices, uh, let's say large um, um, logistics tracking or um, uh, whatever, a fleet management or whatnot, they often end have their own APNs and they use uh, separate ones. So here in the config, we map those to the GGSN. So we create a GGSN configuration with a certain remote IG address, and we map the APN to that GGSN. Um, so then we have, uh, well, the disconnect between the circuit switch and packet switch side. So um, the when it was specified, basically, GSM and GPRS didn't have anything in common at all. They're completely separate. But then both worlds would talk to the same subscriber database, to the same home location register, so you can use the same subscriber authentication mechanisms and identities and so on. In our implementation, we still don't have that interface for various reasons uh, that are too long to tell right now. Um, so you basically need to configure your subscriber both in the circuit switch side and on the packet switch side um, if you want to provide both uh, services to a, a single subscriber. 
Um, then we have OpenGGSN, which uses a different config file and doesn't have a VTY because it's not uh, developed uh, under the same uh, project. Um, also only has very few uh, settings. It's a little bit like configuring DHCP. You say, well, this is the pool of dynamic addresses and this is the DNS server you're supposed to tell to the phone once the phone establishes a connection. Um, and that's really it. So after you set this up, you can do a couple of checks uh, whether all the components are working. Um, and then you can use uh, GPRS services also in your network. Um, and I have to run very quickly through a few slides uh, in order to finish in time. I would have hoped we could do a demo, but I was talking too long. Um, so yeah, there's lots of other Osmocom projects beyond basically this minimal setup that I just described. Um, there are many more interesting protocol stacks with many more interesting abstract and even concrete syntax notations um, uh, and um, many other interesting things beyond GSM like Tetra or GMR or DECT. Um, if you're interested in interesting protocols beyond your everyday protocols, well, check our Git uh, server for the project list, join the mailing lists. Um, uh, you can uh, intercept uh, Soraya satellite phones and we're starting to intercept Iridium as well now with that code. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite a lot of fun uh, learning about these things and implementing them. There's a couple of other implementations. I'm going to skip the slides. Um, we are working right now also on uh, support for uh, 3G uh, in the network in the box and in the SGSN. That's, I would have hoped to be ready right now. Unfortunately, it's not yet, probably take another one or two months, but uh, it will be there soon. It's actively being worked on, and there are some other people working on LTE open source implementations. Unfortunately, one of them has recently switched away from a free, from a GPL to a non-free license, um, but there's still two other projects, SRS LTE and Open LTE, none of which I'm involved in or can tell you a lot about, but then my time has ran out anyway. So, well, uh, thanks for your attention. I know it's sort of, a long ride with fancy acronyms, but uh, I don't know. I've, I found it very interesting to do something that's not uh, TCP IP, you know, that's basically, I mean, I don't want to insult anyone, but I think it's sort of boring after some time. So, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, we have zero minutes for questions, but still, let's try. And I'll be around for more questions, of course. Yes. Um, you mentioned that uh, the ABC interface is running on over TCP. Personally, I have a few customers that use ABIS, and I'm not for sure that at least some of them, I don't know if it's on a proprietary implementation, they use either UDP or OIP. Do you also support non CCP modes, or is it just proprietary implementation of ABIS? Um, basically, ABIS is not 100% standardized, and every vendor modifies it extremely. So I've seen other implementations as well, but no, we only implement the TCP and IPA stacking uh, in our code as far of now. But I don't see any reason why somebody couldn't add another framing or wrapping. Uh, it's, it's not such a big deal to do. Uh, we haven't encountered uh, that in, in the BTS models that we work with. We, ha we didn't have to do this so far, but yeah. for my system. I have a system that accelerates ABIS over uh, satellite links, and I just want to uh, emulate an ABIS link. Is it something that is uh, possible to do with this uh, uh, component, with the NITB, and let's say take the Osmo VTS, and instead of the hardware art dependent part, they replace that with some kind of a, a, a wrapper or emulation layer? Um. Yes, it's something that I've been working on like two weeks ago or so. It's called Osmo BTS Virtual, which basically instead of a real RF interface, um, we use something that we developed earlier called GSM Tab, which is uh, a wrapping layer, how you can wrap air interface protocols with a shim header, like a bit like radio tab in Wi-Fi. We can wrap them and have some extra information and communicate it over UDP. So instead of a radio bearer, we use an IP multicast group um, and the BTS side is implemented to some extent, but on the mobile station side, uh, we have Osmocom BB, which is a telephone implementation of the GSM stack, but there, that work hasn't started yet. Um, but definitely it's like, there's a very small gap to close uh, to run like a virtual mobile station in a virtual BTS with the network in the box and then you have all the interfaces and can play with it without any radio. Yeah. And I'm afraid I have to vacate the room, I think, uh, or, I mean, it's up to you. And I, I it's lunch can, now. It's lunch now, okay. So yeah, we need to, sorry for that. Yeah, we don't want to keep those guys waiting. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>